Hi there everyone, I'm holding a copy of a journal that will be familiar to many astronomers including Professor Mike Merrifield sitting here to my right. This is the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society which interestingly enough I think comes out a few times a month. Several times a month now, yes. There we go. It looks a bit like this when you get a copy. It's full of fascinating latest astronomy research. You've had the odd paper published in here. It's where most of my papers end up being published, yeah. Okay. When it ends up in the Royal Astronomical Society Library, it looks a little bit more posh. They bind it like this. There are shelves and shelves of them behind us. A bit of light reading, perhaps. Well, Professor Merrifield, you've been going through a few old copies. I couldn't resist going back to volume one, page one, just to see where it all began. The very beginning. The very first. Uh, That's it here, is it? This is the very first one. All right, copy number one. And the interesting thing is that this volume here is from 1827 to 1830. So that's three years worth of astronomy in the 19th century. There's a few weeks of astronomy now. There's a few years back in the day. What was the first thing they published? I'm dying to know. So the first thing actually turns out to be not terribly interesting because it was actually just the report of the Council of the Society. So then I kind of went ahead to the first actual astronomical item here, which is number two, which in terms of its content is also not particularly inspiring. But actually its author is quite interesting because this is a paper by Charles Babbage, very famous for the partial invention of computers and so on. And in fact, the first thing he presented to the Royal Astronomical Society was a notice respecting some errors common to many tables of logarithms. So the poor man had been through eight times through the tables of logarithms to try and find errors in them and had turned up half a dozen or so errors in these tables of logs. I would say he's just calling out people's mistakes. Absolutely. So then I leafed on a little further because right. I was just kind of interested. Because Let, lots... Let's find something more positive. Well, there's lots of text here, right? but I found, I think, the first ever figure in monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Okay. Which are pictures of the moon. There was going to be an occultation. That's when a star passes behind the moon. And they were just kind of giving the finding charts of where you ought to look, what the moon's going to look like and where the star's going to disappear to allow people to make these observations. Okay, so it says if you look at the moon, it's going to look like this, and if you look at that part there, that's where the star's going to pop behind the moon and pop out this side. Exactly. But actually, there's some text here which makes it a little clearer as to what's going on. So he's talking about where Aldebaran is going to pass behind the moon. There's a star called Aldebaran, and he said, the object of the council in procuring these computations has been to induce astronomers to look out for the occultations with view principally to determine whether Aldebaran will appear projected on the face of the moon as has frequently been observed in former occultations of this star. So rather than disappearing behind the moon, they were interested as to whether the star would at least initially appear in front of the moon. How could that possibly happen? Well, I think, so there's a little bit more of a clue further on. It is therefore requested that particular attention be paid to the following circumstances, viz. 1. Whether the star undergoes any change of light, of colour or of motion on its immediate approach to the edge of the moon. So I think what they were interested in was whether the moon had an atmosphere. Because if the moon had an atmosphere, then you might get all sorts of optical effects that will cause the light to, to kind of be refracted by the atmosphere. So you might actually see an image of the star briefly in front of the moon. Nice one. Well, there we go. You've got another edition here of the journal. What's this one? Yeah, so this is a kind of, if you were making the best of monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And there's one that was published in, in 1916. And in fact, we have the letter when it was submitted and right. then passed on to the journal. Right. So this letter is by Arthur Eddington. Big think, name, big yeah. name. And this was 1916, which will turn out to be significant in this. And it says, Dear Mr. Wesley, I enclose three papers. And it says, Jeffrey's Hoop and De Sitter, I have received. De Sitter's paper is of exceptional importance and should go in the supplementary number. So clearly he's identified it as something that's very important and should go out immediately. And so that, that was the, the letter and that's go to the journal now. What could this paper be about that's so important that Eddington himself has said, get this thing printed? Title is On Einstein's Theory of Gravitation and Its Astronomical Consequences by W. De Sitter. And it's pretty much immediately after Einstein's relativity paper. And really, this is the sort of the first English language version of general relativity. So this was getting general relativity out to the English speaking world for the first time. And the dates are important here, of course, because Einstein's paper was 1915, this was 1916. This is why the First World War was going on. So you could imagine that communications were quite complicated in terms of getting German science to an English-speaking world. And so I think this is where De Sitter really came in, because De Sitter was Dutch and the Netherlands was neutral. And being Dutch, he was probably reasonably fluent in both German and English. He was a great mathematical physicist in his own right. So not only could he translate it, but he could actually understand what it was he was translating and actually add value to it in the process. So having it come from De Sitter, it was putting like an acceptable face on work at the time that was quite sensitive because it was done by a German. 
I think so, but it must have been largely cosmetic in the sense that everybody knew perfectly well this was Einstein's work, so it was, this was German physics that was being presented, but it was so mind-blowing that actually they had to get beyond the fact that this was German physics to recognise that it was brilliant physics. I know you love a bit of history, Mike. You must enjoy seeing all this physics that you find so fascinating happening in this interesting political context as well. Absolutely. No, it really is the combination of the two and putting these things into that kind of context and seeing like that Eddington letter, which I've never seen before, really kind of adds that human element to the whole story. Oh, there we go. So even though it seems like a pretty normal run-of-the-mill astronomical journal, it's always interesting to go back into the past and see how we got here. This episode of Objectivity was brought to you by 23andMe, the genetic service that will help you learn what the 23 pairs of chromosomes that make up your DNA can teach you about your ancestry, traits and health. If you'd like to help with scientific research and discoveries, or just learn your own personal DNA story, Go to 23andMe.com slash objectivity.